So I'd like to start off today's program by saying how grateful I am to be teaching, living, and learning on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. And it's from learning from and with them that really informs the best practices of OceanWise programs in education, conservation, and research. And it's that main message of looking after the land so that the land can look after us and that reciprocal relationship that we like to embed in all of our work. And we're really grateful for any opportunity to learn and share that like in programs today for Tales from the Deep, insights from OceanWise Research. And so I'd like to welcome Karina, you can say hello. It will switch the video view over to you, and I'll let you get started. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks Danica. How's that? <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Thanks so everybody for joining me here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Karina Draycott, and I work with the Marine Mammal conservation research team at OceanWise. And I am actually physically based up here in Prince Rupert, so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded traditional territory of the nine allied tribes of Metlakatla and Lakwalams of the Simshin people, who have also been study, uh, stewarding and studying this land since time immemorial as well. A lot of people don't actually know that our team has two satellite offices. So we have us here in Prince Rupert in Northern BC, as well as a satellite office down in Victoria. And the rest of our team is over in Vancouver. So I will get started. Today I'm talking about harbor porpoise. So diving right in, um, starting with a little bit of a fun fact, harbor porpoise, their scientific name is Ficina Ficina, which translates from Greek to mean big seal. And the name porpoise comes from porcopiscus, which in medieval Latin translates to pigfish. And similarly in Old Norse, the term marsvin uh, means sea swine or sea pig. So not the most flattering uh, name, but you could see how this might come about, um, especially since they were traditionally harvested in the past for food. And on the east coast of Canada, porpoise were, are affectionately uh, referred to as puffing pigs. And in Norway, the term for porpoise is actually translated in Norwegian to nisa, which translates directly to sneeze. Uh, both of these refer to the noise porpoise make when they surface, as you can see in this picture here. The fact that porpoise are referred to by the noise they make over what they look like speaks to the fact that sometimes you can actually hear a harbor porpoise before you see one. As you can see in this photo, um, they have, they're relatively small in size, they're gray in color, and generally have a low profile, and so they're kind of easy to miss. Because of these characteristics, harbor porpoise um, are sometimes referred to as shy, which is, I guess, a little bit of an anthropomorphic concept. However, they do um, tend to avoid vessels, which makes them a little bit difficult to study. But if you have spent enough time in BC waters, then there's a good chance you've seen harbor porpoise. Um, and this is possibly what you might have glimpsed. Hopefully this video is playing. They're just slow moving, slow surfacing. There's not a lot of splashing and activity that's happening, unlike humpback whales or something. Um, so that's kind of what you would see. And if you're really lucky, like we were this summer, you might get a chance to see a glimpse of a little porpoise face, which I think personally are quite cute. So as many or some of you might know, dolphins, porpoises, and whales belong to this order of cetacea or we refer to them as cetaceans. Um, they're all mammals, and dolphins and porpoises are both odontoceed, or tooth whales, which is a parv order of cetacea. But what is the difference between dolphins and porpoises? Well, some of the confusion comes from the fact that these terms were used synonymously in the past, but they actually come from two very different families uh, that diverged millions of years ago. With the porpoises, uh, there's actually seven species, uh, but with dolphins, there's about four times as many species, uh, including five uh, river dolphins. In fact, these species are more genetically different than lions and tigers, and porpoises are more closely related to monodonts, so those are the narwhals and belugas, uh, than they are to dolphinids. 
Uh, other things to note, uh, which I won't go into too much detail, but the shape of their teeth is different, um, conical versus spade-like. Their dorsal fin is quite different, as you can see in these pictures. They're triangular for porpoises and more sickle-shaped for dolphins. Uh, and then the rostrum, uh, the front of the, of the beak there is elongated in dolphins, and typically dolphins are much more surface active. And they can be seen in large, traveling in really large groups. A little harbor porpoise 101. So a harbor porpoise is about as long as I am tall, which is actually about six feet, quite tall. Um, and females are slightly larger than males, which is unusual in a uh, Males are actually typically larger. So think of a killer whale. A male killer whale is a lot bigger than um, a female killer whale. They inhabit near coastal waters so that are that are more shallow, about 150 meters deep. Um, and they eat small schooling fish and squid and forage in areas with strong currents. And they're also distributed over the continental shelves of the temperate Northern Hemisphere. Here's a little map of their distribution. Uh, there's at least three subspecies of harbor porpoise that are recognized. There's the Pacific harbor porpoise, Ficina ficina vomerina, which we see here. There's also Atlantic harbor porpoise. So that ranges from North Atlantic to no from North America through to Europe and even to Northwest Africa. And there's also a little population in the Black Sea, um, which are considered endangered. And there's a population in, in, the, um, in the Baltic Sea up near Sweden that's considered critically endangered as well. So here in BC, we see two different uh, species of porpoise. We see the harbor porpoise and we see a doll's porpoise. And of course, today I'll focus on harbor porpoise, but they tend to be in small groups. They are elusive and somewhat avoid boats, like I mentioned, and they are uh, listed as special concern under the Species at Risk Act. And what I think is worth mentioning is that we also have documented cases of hybridization between these two species. Thought to be a rare event. Um, usually it's, uh, it's thought to be the male harbor porpoise with the female doll's porpoise, um, but pretty, pretty interesting and they do produce viable offspring. So a life of a harbor porpoise, by all accounts, is pretty fast and furious. They mature at a young age, at an early age, and they reproduce more frequently, and they have a short lifespan compared to other tooth cetaceans. So in BC, the oldest known uh, porpoise was only about 10 years old, and but in other places in the world, I think the oldest one is documented to be about 20 years old. When we see them in the wild, we see them in small groups. Um, often the pairing is a mother calf or mother neonate pair, as you can see in this photo here. Um, but otherwise, uh, th there are some exceptions where we see them in large aggregations of groups of 50 to 100, and that, that happens quite rarely. Um, the other thing to note is there's no accurate, accurate population estimate for BC specifically, and it still remains a little uncertain as to whether there's a single population within BC or subpopulations. The aquatic shrew. This is a term that's thrown around because uh, harbor porpoise spend such a huge amount of their time searching and foraging for food. These animals have high metabolic requirements, so they need a lot of energy and they need a lot of food. Um, and so when they're disturbed, that can have pretty big impacts on their um, ability to forage and, and is a, a risk to them. Their diet it consists of small schooling fish and squid, like I mentioned. Uh, the, in BC, there is a study done that showed that the, a large portion was 60% was made up of Pacific herring. But some other important prey species include walleye pollock, <clears throat> ulican, sand lance, anchovy, hake, and opalescent squid. So they, done, they tend to really be distributed in these highly productive coastal areas with lots of um, upwelling and high tidal flow, and um, that's something we consistently have in BC. <clears throat> so in order to eat food all the time, you have to be able to find your, your food all the time, which is somewhat tricky in the dark waters of BC, which is why so many of these um, marines' life have evolved to take advantage of underwater sound. <clears throat> so sound, unlike light, can travel tens to thousands of kilometers underwater. And like bats, porpoises and other tooth whales have um, used biological sonar to navigate and locate their prey. So it's really cool. They 
are able to emit these like high power clicks that are really rapid, uh, like 20 per second. So they're called click trains. And then they process the return of these echoes. Uh, they actually, in the right, you can see an image, they use this structure called the melon to emit the sound in a narrow beam about 12 degrees wide to focus on a target, and then they're able to track it. They click faster and faster as they get close to it. Um, and they echolocate at a high frequency, so around 130 kilohertz. And to put that in perspective, humans can hear up to around 20 kilohertz, and dogs can hear about 60 kilohertz. <clears throat> and then in the picture on the bottom right, there's a really cool video that I wasn't able to embed, but I strongly encourage you to check it out and maybe we can post that in the chat. But there's a, a harbor porpoise in captivity named Freya and there's she's actually got suction cups over her eyes and they've done a lot of experiments showing just how good they are at using echolocation to determine different objects and find those objects, um, just kind of emulating what they do when they're looking for uh, prey and how unimportant site is in, in comparison. <clears throat> they also have um, exceptionally good uh, hearing across many different frequencies. And the thought is that because they're echolocating at such a high frequency, this might have been an adaptation to avoid killer whale predation. So killer whales, <clears throat> they, uh, they have hearing up to about 100 kilohertz and then it starts to taper off. So by echolocating at an even higher frequency, the thought is that they can avoid this predation. Well, some of them can avoid this predation, but not all of them. This harbor porpoise is clearly less lucky and is being attacked by a marine mammal eating big or transient killer whale. Uh, and he's flying through the air, so not a great fate. Um, there's also some thought that uh, harbor porpoise uh, are eaten by Pacific sleeper sharks as well, but there's not a lot of uh, data on that to date. So uh, bigs or transient killer whales, they hunt in stealth mode, they're quiet. <clears throat> and uh, these harbor porpoise, at the end of the day, they're just not fast enough to evade predation from these whales. In addition to natural threats, there are also a lot of anthropogenic threats to harbor porpoise. So they're, like I mentioned before, they're listed as a species of special concern. Um, both internationally and here in Canada, and uh, harbor porpoise strandings occur more than any other cetacean species in BC. So the number one um, cause of death is infectious disease. We often conduct necropsies on all corpses that are stranded or collected. The other one is from traumatic blunt force or anthropogenic causes. So that can include entanglement in fishing gear or being struck by a ship, that kind of thing. Entanglement is uh, is a main threat for porpoise in BC, specifically with the salmon gillnet fishery, which is identified as a source of mortality. There's a lot of research and studies that go into uh, advancing the technology to try and reduce this bycatch, but it's definitely still uh, an impact on, on these animals. Other threats uh, include disturbance and displacement. It's important to consider that uh, their range is, is overlaps a lot with like uh, human coastal populations. So because of that, there's a lot of overlap for noise pollution from shipping, coastal development, so pile driving and develop, uh, dredging, as well as the contaminants uh, that, uh, that are coming, uh, chemical pollutants and PCBs into water uh, that these purpose have as a risk. And then vessel strike. So in the picture to the top right, um, you can see there's some uh, slashes that might have been caused by uh, vessel damage from potentially like a prop or something like that. So the BC Cetacean Sightings Network is something that we as a team help to run and we collect sightings from citizens up and down the coast. And we actually have a collection of 11,458 harbor porpoise sightings to date. Uh, dating back to 1985. So you can see on this map that the distribution is all in those near shore of waters. Um, and there's a lot of sightings. There's a lot of uh, corpus living in our waters. Looking at this map, this actually is a um, effort corrected map that shows the relative abundance of harbor porpoise. So on the left, you have the summer distribution. And on the right, you can see effort corrected for winter distribution. And they do, they do vary a little bit. 
um, and we see that up here in Prince Rupert waters. It's worth mentioning that we also have some uh, harbor porpoise that occupy deeper waters that are exceeding 200 meters, which is less common, specifically in the Strait of Georgia, uh, as you can see on the bottom right, and then as well as the southwest coast of Haida Gwaii and the southeast of Cape St. James. So those are also um, so, and by effort corrected, uh, what I mean is we've been taken into account uh, a lot of different, so we get uh, a higher number of sightings near coastal communities or places where we would have more humans. So we try to take uh, that into account along with a bunch of other measures to, to uh, using a model uh, to, to blend that out so that we can actually know where the, the porpoises are versus just where there's lots of people reporting porpoises. <clears throat> habitat range. So these porpoises are widespread through near shore coastal areas of BC. Uh, some studies suggest that individuals have actually restricted uh, habitat ranges, and those are characterized by unique habitats that might feature uh, more frequently used or important areas. Um, and this actually has big implications because it would mean that those harbor, harbor porpoise that are specifically in hanging out in one spot may be more vulnerable to threats and localized depletion in those areas. So within BC, there's been some studies done that we know about some favorable habitats down south, some great work by Dr. Ann Hall. And up here, I'll talk a little bit about some of those spots that we've identified in the north coast near Prince Rupert. So here is a map of Prince Rupert, and these are, <clears throat> excuse me, sightings uh, from the last five years showing that there are a lot of uh, sightings in and around the approach to Prince Rupert and in the harbor. And what's particularly interesting is that up here we've seen these large aggregations of harbor porpoise of 50 to up to 100 uh, harbor porpoise. And myself, I haven't seen 100, but I've definitely been out on the water and seen groups of 30 to 50. And it's also worth noting that those aggregations typically occur in the winter months over the summer months. Um, and over the last 10 or 20 years, we've, uh, tip we've seen this consistently, these reporting of large um, aggregations. So we wanted to explore this a little bit further. We've also had some observ observations uh, showing that animals in this region display behaviors a little less common associated with harbor porpoise. So quick swimming, rooster tails, this, all the things that I said that they didn't really do um, kind of surface active behavior, mating, uh, very interesting. And here's a little example of that. Quick movement and quick behavior, little rooster. When I say rooster tail, I mean that spray of water that kind of comes up when they surface, when they're moving quickly. And we've seen quite a lot of this. To excuse the shaky video. Hopefully that came through okay. And the other thing that we have seen is uh, witnessed actual mating attempts. So just a little fun fact here for you. Uh, during breeding season, the male harbor porpoise testes actually reach three to six percent of body mass, so 13 times larger than the average mammalian testes to body mass ratio. Um, and these males compete um, by sperm competition, not contest competition. Uh, and studies actually shown that aerial behavior is usually associated with these attempts. And they also are always uh, approached from the left side. So William Keener and their colleagues did a study down in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Bridge, observing 144 mating events. And they did support that uh, this was the case and that there was always like this left side approach. And 73% of those attempts were aerial attempts, which we also saw up here. In addition to collecting sightings and documenting behavior, we've also been opportunistically collecting photo ID pictures, which is extremely difficult, but not impossible. And there have been a few other studies that have tried to do this. Uh, the benefit of doing this is that we can look at site fidelity. Are there porpoises that are like specifically using this area for extended periods of time? And what we've, we haven't um, been able to collect too many photos to date, but we have seen re sightings of mother calf pairs for several months at a time. And so just to show you, we're able to look at 
site fidelity by re-identifying, reciting um, specific animals. And we can tell that by these features, these little scars and markations um, on the, the dorsal side of their body that we can actually see from the water. So you have to be very quick with the camera. So in 2016, we also began a dedicated pilot study to explore some of these questions about how harbor porpoise are using these waters specifically. Are there clear patterns of habitat use and potential change associated with anthropogenic factors? Um, and I mean, this is a very commercially active area with shipping and development. So um, what's what does that look like and what does it look like over time? So we use two different approaches. We use land-based surveys and as well as acoustic monitoring. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on what, what our methods look like and some of what we've, we've found to date. So here's a map of our study site. It's important to remember that this area, we have big tides um, up to 7.7 .7 meters or 23 feet. So you have to be very careful when you leave a boat on the beach for any extended period of time because before you know it you'll be high and dry the, the tide changes really quickly here and so the thought is that with these upwelling events um, together with strong tidal streams and island wakes and headland eddies this is likely like a really great spot uh, for fishing and that prey aggregate in this area so the circle is our study site um, the star is our land survey site and then the, the little dot is where our acoustic device has been deployed. And that's kind of just showing we get up to five knots of current uh, in the entrance to the harbor there. So land surveys. So we started conducting land surveys with a combination of uh, help from volunteers as well as uh, from uh, our staff. And we followed similar protocols used by Aileen Jeffries and the Pacific Biological Diversity Institute in Washington. And so when we do this, what we do is we go for two hours at a time and we scan in 10 minute intervals, recording the location within the study, the direction of travel and the type of behavior. So we have this grid overlay so we know which zone the purposes are in. <clears throat> Simultaneously, we're also, the other person is uh, collecting information on vessel traffic uh, as it travels in and out of the study site, what type of boats, um, and the type of activity. It's also worth uh, noting that there is a limiting factor with visual surveys is that you have to be able to see, go figure. So we use these high power scopes, but we can only really survey when it's Beaufort 2 or under, which basically means no white caps because as soon as there's a white cap it's really easy to lose that little glimpse of a dorsal fin that you can see um, so no wind no fog and it has to be daylight so some of what we found we, we were able to conduct surveys from 2016 to 2018 and then 2019 there was a big construction project that was started so we weren't unfortunately unable to access the land survey site anymore uh, we completed a total of 80 hours of data collection, um, mostly in summer months and typically in Beaufort 1, so pretty calm waters. During those 10 minute intervals, uh, the, the highest number of groups we ever recorded were six. And in those groups, the largest number of uh, individuals in the group were 15. So the average group size was only 1.5. A lot of these groups we saw were small groups of harbor porpoise, so we never really saw while doing the surveys, these larger aggregations, um, those had been captured kind of off effort when we weren't surveying. Uh, the average boats were about per 10 minute interval was two, so it's still a, a quite a tra uh, traffic heavy area. The most frequent being fishing vessels followed by ferries and large motor vessels. And then from 2017 onwards, it's also worth noticing, noting that there was there's a big grain terminal in our study site um, where there's often a ship. And so in 100% of the surveys from 2017 on, there was always this big ship being loaded in, um, at, uh, at the terminal. We also saw in 2.3% of the data set um, that there were calves total, so 11 of the total interval times. When analyzing land-based data, it's important to remember that the sample size is relatively small, but we did find that there was a negative correlation between porpoise presence and the number of vessels in the study site. So this kind of makes sense. We've seen, and uh, we know that uh, harbor porpoise uh, 
typically avoid vessels, but at the same time, it's important to consider that they choose their habitat based on the fact that their concern is about food and predation. So if this is a good, op good space to be where there's limited predation and a lot of food, the area will be important regardless of all this vessel and noise activity. On the right uh, is a porpoise index by season, and this really just is a figure that shows the larger groups were seen in the winter than in the summer months. All right, switching gears a little bit to acoustics. So listening to porpoises. In order to collect acoustic data, we use passive acoustic monitoring, specifically something called a C pod, um, which you can see on the right. So passive means that we're listening to sounds versus emitting sounds. And the sounds of interest in this case, marine mammal vocalizations are the porpoise clicks. So they have these really fast click trains that are picked up by the C pod. And what we're looking for is presence and absence of uh, these species. We've picked up killer, uh, mostly harbor porpoise and very rarely uh, killer whales as well. Um, we're also looking at patterns in presence. So uh, daily patterns, seasonal, interannual, as well as temporal overlap with potentially like industrial activity and that kind of thing. Um, the one limiting factor in this context is that in order for you to be able to tell if animals in the area, they have to be vocalizing, so they have to be clicking. And a recent study by Williamson et al. did identify that uh, porpoises have a greater sleeping period um, or quiet period than previously known for, for about 4 to 8 percent of time. And acoustic monitoring is, is super useful in many other contexts that I won't necessarily go into, but you can look at behavioral states and tracking animals and abundance and dive counts and even temporal change, so like long term. Uh, and that's really uh, useful and something that we could look into further. So our data collection, the CPOD, like I mentioned, we actually have help from the Prince Rupert Port Authority. Their crew helps us deploy and retrieve the CPOD. And in the last year, we've used the same approach. We've uh, deployed for about 75 days and it runs on batteries, but the, in the CPOD, there's a hydrophone and a built-in classifier to record click detections. So it's able to tell you within you know, a minute, how was their detection positive? Uh, we're able to say, like, is there presence on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, and really start to, to dig into that in terms of tide and other factors. Um, this boy is on the surface. It's, semi, it's a semi-permanent mooring boy, so it's got a big anchor, and it's about five meters above where the sea pot is, about five meters into the, sea, into the water column, and of about 25 meters, so 70 feet deep is where the sea pot is. And there's a limiting range here, which is uh, the sea bar can collect from a, for about a radius of 450 meters. Acoustic detections. So as of January 2021, we'll have our first year of like full acoustic uh, data collection. Um, we in the past, we've put it down for periods of time, but none of it's been uh, consecutive. So that'll be really interesting to see. Uh, we also have had some variability in our different types of deployment strategies, but for this area, and there's big tides and winds, this seems to be the most, the working the best for us to date. At the bottom, there's a graph that shows detection positive minutes over the time that it's, the CPOD's been down in 2020. So you can see there's actually a pretty clear spike um, in the spring. And this year, the herring spawn took place from around mid-March to mid-April, so that's likely indicative of that. Um, we've also seen strong deal trends. If you look at the graph to the top right, um, you see there's a higher number of porpoise clicks during the daylight hours. So when it gets light, about 6 or 7, through to when it gets dark, around 8 or 9. Um, and that's come and go, gone um, within the data over different periods of time. We've also seen uh, uh, correlations with a strong tides, which is something that many other groups have uh, researched and witnessed with harbor porpoise globally. Lastly, uh, just with the deal, I wanted to mention that this is often linked to the distribution of prey. So different nocturnal and diurnal patterns are linked to the distribution of prey and the dependency on their habitat. So um, sometimes that can be a very clear link that requires more investigating. Take home messages. So 
there's still a lot to learn about harbor porpoise in BC, but hopefully you've learned a few things about how interesting they are. Um, but they are challenging to research. They're definitely not as glamorous as some of the larger cetaceans, but they're important. It's important to look at um, these species with regards to their fine scale population structure and their varying habitat use. So with further research, we could better understand how things like tides and other drivers affect the presence and relative abundance of these species and better understand how anthropological pressures might impact them or threats such as noise pollution. So our hope is to continue this, this important data collection on harbor porpoise um, long term for this region and to develop a baseline from which we can monitor change. What can you do? Um, it's a, there's lots of things you can do, but here are a few suggestions. Uh, one of the things you can do is contribute to the citizen science uh, by reporting your sightings of whales, porpoises, and dolphins using the Whale Report app, which is free, available to uh, download, um, both with iOS uh, uh, and online. And you can also uh, use our web form, wildwhales.org, or sightings at ocean.org, or you can call it in at 1886 ISAW1. one As I mentioned, bycatch in fisheries is another threat to harbor porpoise, so supporting, purchasing, and eating like local ocean-wise sustainable seafood can also be um, great. These fishermen use the best practices available. And then following be whale wise guidelines. So making sure you know your marine mammal regulations, staying 100 meters away from, from marine mammals. Um, and then uh, you can also get involved by joining shoreline cleanups or even supporting this research by virtually adopting killer whales. So those are a handful of things that you can do. Oh, here's some of that information here. And then lastly, I just wanted to thank our support from our project funders and some references and then hand it over to you guys if you have questions for me. But thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Karina. I love Harbor Porpoises and I learned so many new things from your <laughs> presentation. So that was fantastic. Um, and, and I really, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's just a wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, there's lots of great questions in the chat that um, we'll dive into. And I really appreciate how you shared all those fantastic ways that people can help support harbor porpoises. That's always <laughs> one of the top questions. Um, mm -hmm. I know that near the end of your presentation, you were showing some great uh, graphs and slides <laughs> from your research. And so the first question that came up was, um, what does temporal overlap mean? Um, let's see, I have to remember what, within the context of what, um, do you, what, did they elaborate at all? Temporal overlap uh, in terms of, uh, there's just a lot of different avenues I could go with that. <laughs> Totally fair. I'm just checking the chat to see if um, they can jump in with a little bit more information. It was when you were talking about uh, the sea pod and listening to porpoises. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. Oh, okay. So temporal overlap in terms of um, industrial activity. So what we could do is, for example, by looking Prince Rupert is a perfect example, actually. Right now, they're undergoing a big uh, road expansion project. So they're um, they're in backfilling part of the coast. And during this time, we could look to see if there are um, any noticeable impacts in porpoise presence uh, while they are doing this activity, or if we've seen a reduction in clicks space, or um, even from our surveys, we can monitor that that kind of temporal overlap. Is That's kind of what I meant by that. Um, so if uh, I think the context is really relevant in terms of marine mammal observers, a lot of the time there are people with that exact um, job of monitoring to make sure that there aren't um, big impacts. And if there are marine mammals in the area, they'll even shut down their operations for an extended period of time. Ah, oh, that's wonderful news. Um, another question that came up, and I think you kind of briefly answered it at the end with some things that people can do to help, was, you know, are there regulations in place 
for voters that say that they have to stay a certain distance or turn off their motor or reduce sound. <laughs> you bet, yeah. Um, there's a lot of really great resources um, that you can look up. Uh, one of them is the Be Whale Wise guidelines, and that's like a little pamp, there's a website and a little video that we have actually created at OceanWise that reviews some of those uh, regulations. So we can give those links. But um, some of the best practices are uh, really to give marine mammals space. Um, you want to give them at least 100 meters and 200 meters up north for killer whales and 400 meters for southern residents. We want to turn our engines off when it's safe to do so. You can also turn your uh, sonar off, like your depth sounder, or your fish finder. Those are all really useful um, things. Uh, make sure not to like kind of park your boat in front of uh, the direction of travel of marine mammals. Um, yeah, the list kind of goes on and on, uh, but those are some of the main ones. Wonderful. Well, there's lots of great questions um, about kind of vessel noise and how that affects these animals. And so a couple of questions is, is are there any hydrophones permanently deployed in Prince Rupert by the OceanWise team that record vessel noise? And do we have any evidence that underwater noise is disrupting hunting or socializing for harbor port? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, so in Prince Rupert, there is no, there is one hydrophone and that's owned by Oceans Network Canada that is at the mouth of the Prince Rupert Harbor. So you can go and look at that observation station to look at underwater noise and they have a bunch of really great resources. Um, that's similar to a lot of their stations kind of all over BC. So that's a, a great resource and all of their information and data is uh, freely accessible to the public. Um, in terms of us having a, a long uh, permanent hydrophone as great as that would be, we don't currently have one. Um, uh, but there are F hopes to uh, better understand uh, some of the noise pollution impacts in this region. It's been identified by the Port Environmental Stewardship Committee as like a priority with industry to kind of look at uh, noise pollution and better understand that. Uh, and that's a project that OceanWise is super interested in. Um, and I'm just trying to remember the second half of that question. <laughs> uh, Was there just any evidence so far about vessel noise or underwater noise affecting these? Yeah, um, there's definitely some great studies. A lot of the research on harbor porpoise actually has come out of uh, Europe. Um, they uh, harbor porpoise is one of the main species seen around the UK and other places uh, as compared to here. A lot of our research tends to be on larger species, but there are impacts. Um, they've found that harbor porpoise, uh, like many other marine mammals, um, will uh, leave an area with certain uh, underwater noises. Um, they also find that there can be masking occurring. So uh, there can, if there's enough noise at the right kilohertz that they, uh, they might not be able to communicate as well. Um, this can also have impacts for uh, specifically communication between uh, mothers and calves or for contact calls. Um, and generally, like the noise can just create uh, a very stressful environment. And we've seen that in a lot of marine mammals that that elevated level of stress um, seen in their hormone levels due to uh, the noise levels. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So lots of good reasons to check out those be wild wise guidelines. And if you are out on the water to follow those and uh, keep them as stress free as possible. <laughs> um, there was some great connection to looking at the surveying that you were doing. And um, so one question was, when did the ID surveys start? And then is there a chance that you might be able to ID Levi, one of the harbor porpoises that was rescued and released by our Marine Mammal Rescue Center? <laughs> um, that's a good question. <laughs> Levi, yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, so we started, I, I guess, opportunistically collecting these, this photo ID back in 2016 when we first opened up our office up here. Um, 
but it hasn't been a super concentrated effort. Uh, you need to spend a lot of time on the water near the porpoises and you have to have a big zoom lens. Um, so I would say, yeah, we'll continue to do this. And now that we have a research vessel up here in Prince Rupert, which we've had for the last two years, we can kind of improve upon that effort to date. Uh, I think the odds are low that we would be able to find Levi, but uh, if, yeah, if we had a good picture and it matched, we would be able to hopefully um, to, to be able to identify that if it was indeed uh, a, a clear match between dorsals. Um, Levi, I'm trying to remember, I think Levi was before my time, but uh, <laughs> most likely hanging out down south somewhere. Actually, that's great. If our audience um, does remember what year Levi was with us, I was trying to remember. Um, so you can feel free to share that in the chat. I'd love the, the refresher, but I think it wasn't a number of years ago. So yes, hopefully he's doing well out there in the mm -hmm. ocean. Um, and then we had um, a great question too about the necropsies that you mentioned for some of the um, animals that you find. And do you ever find plastic or um, other pollutants in their stomach? Is that another concern that we should be keeping in mind? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know a ton about the necropsy results with regards to porpoises. I have uh, witnessed one done by uh, Dr. Stephen Rafferty, who is excellent. He's kind of our go-to guy on the the West Coast here for for those necropsies. But from what I from what I understand, a lot of it is more to do with um, some kind of illness and or uh, uh, entanglement. Or uh, I don't think there's been like extensive cases of of plastic plastic pollution found in their stomach. But um, I'd have to look into it a bit more to look at that data. I don't think there's been um, much uh, published on that to date. Yeah. Oh, well, it's always good to know what kind of next steps there might be more research to be uncovered. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much. I know that we're just at time. And so we hopefully got through um, many of the questions and we really look forward to if you do have more questions, you can always send them our way and uh, we'd be happy to answer those for you. I really love how the audience just came to life with sharing that Levi was with us in 2013. So oh, wow. that was already a while ago um, and we were able to share a past aqua blog there if anyone <laughs> wants to reminisce <laughs> a little bit. Um, so thank you again. That was fantastic and if you do want to uh, share Karina's presentation or refer back to it at any point, we will be posting the recording on the OceanWise YouTube channel. You can also find a whole gallery of past presentations for Tales from the Deep at our education.ocean.org website so you can see past uh, presentations there so you can check out the whole series. I'm just going to switch over my presentation to just mention some ways that you can stay connected with us as we're really excited that next week we have our next Tales from the Deep with Jennifer Chapman from our Ocean Watch team. She is going to be presenting on COVID-19 waves of change and some of the changes, both um, positive and maybe questionable um, that we've seen since this time of great change. So we really hope that you tune in with us for that presentation um, to learn a little bit more. We have a few more weeks of Tales from the Deep coming up before we hit the kind of December holiday season, as we know a lot of people um, maybe changing their plans or maybe staying put. We'll have to we'll have to see what happens there. Um, but you can always see what's coming up for Tales from the Deep by checking out the OceanWise Facebook page under events. It's great if you follow that or share an interest, you can share it with more folks that might want to tune in and join you. 
or it gives you a friendly reminder when it's coming up. So it's always a great way to stay connected with those programs. We're also really excited that our final kind of special Tales from the Deep presentation on December 17th is going to be a special public lecture from the OceanWise Seafood team. And so you can head over to ocean.org slash learn online to see our calendar of online public events and all of the links you need to register there. Um, you can also, again, continue to follow our online events on the OceanWise Facebook page. So all you have to do is search OceanWise there for you. Um, and if you haven't already heard on some of our social media accounts, it's a great way to follow our OceanWise Seafood team. Um, just as Karina mentioned, eating sustainable seafood is a great way to help support the animals that we all love and care about. Um, but also they have just released that they are going to be doing an ongoing chowder chowdown seafood fundraiser. So there'll be some tasty tips to check out online with that. And if you'd like to follow along with other initiatives that OceanWise Education has ongoing, you can always check out our Twitter at OceanWise EDU. And in in addition to the great Chowder Chowdown fundraiser, there's always so many great community projects that help share support for the Vancouver and OceanWise at this time. And so you can always see what's going on um, and connect to vanaqua.org slash support slash community. And if you're already maybe thinking in a holiday mindset, there's some amazing ways that you can support local and support OceanWise at the same time. So thank you so much for joining us today and a big thank you to Karina. And a thank you, big thank you to our audience. We hope to see you again next week. <laughs> thank you.